Hello. Wow, this is a rush because I'm here to talk about a big passion of mine. Um, well, I have multiple, but it is about growth. It is about growing people and growing businesses. And when you grow businesses and grow people, you need money, right? Um, so I come now from uh, a long career in finance and uh, now actually also as a CEO. And I'm here to share with you some of my experiences and some thoughts. And I hope that some of my experiences or um, advice can help you as you think about how to build your business and how to fund that business throughout the way. Now, I'm looking for a, how to flip my slides. I don't have a, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, this is me. Uh, and uh, already I got this great introduction, so you know what I've done. I'm also a non-executive board member of a company called Fishbrain. It's also a rapid growing tech business funded out of Stockholm. Uh, their main uh, market is actually in the US. So, you know, my whole career and, and passion is about rapid growth and tech companies. But before we move into the funding, I wanted to uh, give you some background on Readly and um, the Readly story. Uh, and uh, Readly is the category leader in Europe for digital magazine subscriptions. And uh, we currently have around 1 million users uh, in about 50 countries. Uh, but we have uh, local content from 12 markets. So we're now up to over 7,000 titles. We have uh, offices in Stockholm, Växjö, uh, Berlin, uh, London, and lately also Paris, actually, because we recently acquired a French business. So that's all very exciting. And um, this is the really story, the growth business. It was founded uh, by a serial entrepreneur called Joel Vikel. And he got this idea when he was uh, on vacation in Cyprus. He was by the poolside um, and he was uh, getting frustrated because he had run through all the magazines he brought with him. Uh, many of us, at least I do, tend to read a lot of magazines when I have time off. Uh, and he was listening to music on his mobile and he was like, I want a Spotify for magazines. Why, why can't I access all the content I want in my pocket? But being a serial entrepreneur and successful founder of several tech companies before that, he just went home and he built the thing. And uh, then he launched uh, Readly uh, in 2012. And since then, we've grown, as I mentioned, to uh, 12 markets and uh, with a lot of amazing content from 1,200 publishers and 1 million users and people in multiple offices. And that takes money, right? So you can see here our story. Uh, the first time uh, really raised venture capital funding was in 2014 and uh, of course that was a big uh, landmark event for the business uh, and then uh, that gave the company a lot of funds to be able to grow into more markets and then in 2018 was the first institutional investor it was a uh, Ruber Funds, a uh, huge uh, fund institutional investor in Sweden. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we could welcome more institutional investors. And uh, ultimately, uh, last year, uh, around this time, or it was in September, I rang the bell for NASDAQ uh, as we IPO'd. So that was a massive event, of course. And so, I mean, both at Readly, you know, I have a lot of experience of how to think about, or at least how Readly and other companies that I work for have thought about funding throughout the year and uh, some things to think about there. So for Readly, 
we ended up doing an IPO, but other companies take other types of um, routes. And uh, the other company that I worked for before I joined Readly was a company, it was called iSettle at the time. Now it's changed name to Zettle by PayPal. Uh, some of you know that company as well. Uh, it was founded out of Stockholm, rapidly grew into some 10, 12 markets. And uh, their business idea uh, when they found it was uh, a very user-friendly and uh, good-looking, I might add, uh, device to accept credit card payments on your mobile, uh, which is a great thing for small businesses uh, who can't afford or don't want to pay massive amount of money for huge credit card um, uh, companies. So I will talk a little bit about the experiences, both from the iSettle case and, and really. So you start up, right, the startup phase, and there are a lot of people contacting me, uh, reaching out to say, you know, I just started my business. How shall I think about funding? And um, they reach out to me on LinkedIn or, or wherever I go, and uh, I, I always say, wait. <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. Um, you know, it's, I know early on, especially if you have a great idea that gets a lot of attention and uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in investing in you, investing in your idea, uh, that you get a bit starstruck and, and you want to raise a lot of money because you also want to feel secure, right? That you know you have enough money to grow your business quickly. But you need to think about when is the right time to start handing away control. Uh, because that is what will happen as you raise money from outsiders, right? They will take a stake of your business and they want some control then uh, and voting power. And um, so I, I would really, I, you know, I, at least I recommend that to people ask me. Uh, try to wait, try to fund it as much as you can, as long as you can. When it's time to start raising external capital uh, eventually, I would also say uh, try to find the people who want you to succeed. You know, angel investors or people in the industry uh, who have a passion for what you do. You have a shared vision of what you want to achieve in the world. So they're not necessarily only doing it to make a buck. They're there to make you succeed because they believe in what you do. And maybe that can also lend their good name to you. That can share advice to you. That can sit on an advisory board or your board of directors or... That can be like a poster name. Um, and uh, I see a friend from ISL here. I had to say hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, so uh, that's what I would, where I would start. And it, it may not be so easy at first. Where do you find these people? Where do you find these names, right? And uh, I actually get a lot of people contacting me through LinkedIn complete strangers uh, who want to pick my brain, who want to buy me a coffee or something. So that's one way to, to start. Um, can be quite successful. Um, yeah. Next slide. So now you reach the scale-up phase. So you have a proven product or service. You have a business. You have a customer. Uh, or many customers, you have a proven demand, uh, and now you're just eager to really scale up that business. And time to market is critical. I've seen several awesome, very disruptive ideas, uh, and they were just not fast enough uh, to launch it to market. So they got, uh, you know, overrun by, by others very quickly. So, so the, in this situation, it's very natural to think, I need more money, right? I need to be able to scale up fast. Um, then it's maybe time to start talking to uh, investors, venture capital firms, or other large scale investors. Maybe you're talking to some of them here today. And then it's really about matchmaking. Matchmaking is key. You should think about it as a marriage. Like you're going to go deep in bed with these people for a long time. Uh, it may not be a marriage that is supposed to last forever, but you should think about it at least for give or take five years. 
And uh, you know, when these, these investors, they are willing to bet on you and your product, uh, but that means they need a high uh, opportunity for a yield back. Uh, so they, they will want a fairly big stake in your business, I, I, I imagine. And so uh, they're going to be on your board. They're going to have a lot of voting power. Um, so you really need to think hard and long, is this the right match for me? Uh, do due diligence on them. Try to see if you can talk to uh, other founders that they have invested in. Like, what's their pet peeves? What's their style? Uh, what's their approach? What, um, how are they to work with? You know, will they let the founder uh, be quite self-sufficient uh, and make the big decisions? Or will they get involved in every single detail? Uh, because you need to be know who you're going to marry and live with for the next five years. That's what I was going to say. Um, at, at this stage also, uh, I, I saw there was a, another um, uh, leader up here talking about performance uh, metrics, how to uh, monitor your performance. And uh, of course, it's very important when you pitch uh, that you uh, can uh, show them your vision, uh, that you have a credibility in your track record. But these people uh, really place a large emphasis also on the business viability, the business model, uh, your unit economics. Is it a sustainable business? And you need to be on top of your numbers. You really need to be able to spit out the churn and the CAC and the LTV and the, you know, your forecast. Uh, by a blink and so I would say that if you are not a numbers person and that's okay right we all have different strengths uh, you know you should if you haven't already um, hooked up with a CFO or some kind of really kick-ass uh, business controller uh, somebody's really strong number person you know this is time you should do that uh, both to make sure that your business is running as you hope and plan, but also that can uh, pair up with you in investor meetings uh, to be able to give the, the answers immediately. You cannot sit at a meeting with uh, these investors and, and they ask, what's your churn? And you're like, uh, can I get back to you? That's not going to fly. So that's very important at this stage. Um, yeah, so hopefully you are able to attract great investors who is a great match for you and your business is uh, continue to take off. And then uh, the last uh, sort of uh, funding type event that I was going to bring up today uh, is, uh, you know, either if you do an IPO, for example, or if you end up in an M&A transaction. And it looks very different for everybody. By this time, some founders may already have left the business. Uh, some founders uh, will stick around for another couple of years after the IPO, and some will stay long term. So it's very different for everybody. Um, but uh, if, we, uh, if we start with uh, the settle case, I settle. So uh, this was actually not meant to be an acquisition upfront, and it was not a planned dual track uh, process. Many companies do a dual track process. What does that mean? That means that you are both looking for a potential buyer to your business at the same time as you're preparing to go public through an IPO. That was not the case here. It was not a dual track pro uh, process until very late stage. Uh, I was actually brought on board as the CFO to take the company public, and we worked very hard for one and a half year to make the company ready. And I think uh, at the end, it turned out that PayPal came knocking on the door very late stage and did an accelerated, super confidential uh, due diligence and ended up 
uh, buying the company, it was only two weeks uh, before we were supposed to ring the bell. You know, I say that every IPO has a defining moment, and this was really it when I was uh, at midnight. I was sitting at home in my sofa, and my suit was hanging there ready, pressed, because the day after I was going to meet investors, the final push before the IPO, and then uh, I think it was five past midnight, uh, the ink was on the paper and the company was sold instead. Uh, but I think some of the really success factors then was that we had gone through the process of making the company ready for an IPO. So if you look at a company like PayPal, especially US businesses, they are quite risk advert. So uh, they actually paid $2.2 billion for iSettle. That was 11 times sales. So that was a huge uh, that was a huge success. And why did they pay this amount of money? Why was this so successful? They, could, they felt that they could trust iSettle, that the books were in order, that it had been managed well, that uh, you know, the IT controls worked. They tried to hack iSettle you know, and things like that to see that you know, we were really on top of the business. And, they had gone through, you know, I had gone through uh, enormous scrutiny by the stock exchange when they do the audit. So they felt that they could really trust the business and they were, they were willing to pay a premium for that. Uh, the other thing was that, you know, I settled had uh, another, a different option. You know, two weeks later, there was a huge demand. It was the IPO of the year that everybody were talking about in all of Europe. And we were also over in the US and talked to very interested investors, you know, from the West Coast to Midwest to the East Coast. So there was a real uh, option uh, for ISETA, which gave the sellers a great leverage in those negotiations. So there were a lot of factors involved here. Uh, that made that was, uh, that was a great uh, deal. Uh, when it came to Readly, that was a, an IPO process through and through from, from day one. Uh, but getting a company ready for an IPO, you know, as a founder uh, or a leader of a business, uh, you should be aware that both I said Readly, any company that want to go public, you really need to uh, have good internal controls, uh, you need to have, you know, risk management, long-term strategies. You need to have a professional board. Uh, you need to be able to report your monthly and quarterly earnings uh, very fast with high quality. So there is a lot of work to, to get a company ready for that. Um, and at the end of the day, we really was uh, approved uh, to go public. Uh, we were great. So I, I, I walk around and say I've done 1.99 IPOs because that's... It was almost two. Uh, but I mean, when you also think about IPO, you sh before you press the button, you should really think about the afterlife. So being a public company, uh, you know, has a lot of great advantages. Not only are you leaving the bell ringing with a huge pile of money to fund your future growth. Uh, but it also comes with some things like you have to open up your books every quarter. Uh, you need to maintain investor relations and these policies and procedures and board meetings and stuff. So, uh, you know, you're going to be in the public eye uh, a lot more and have a lot of more things to consider. So when it comes to the M&A track, uh, and this is where I think uh, iSettle did really well, is to think about... You know, if, if you sell your company, high likelihood is you will be locked up for years. They won't want you to leave. Uh, and maybe you don't want to leave either. Maybe you want to continue to the, uh, with the journey. Uh, so you need to really not just get uh, dazzled by the pile of money that they want to pay for your business, but you need to think about, do I have shared values with these people? Do we have shared vision? You know, what will it be like to work with these guys? Uh, will, will this be, will they uh, make my business more successful? Will one plus one equal three at the end of the day? Uh, because otherwise it can be a pretty uh, painful experience uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, if, you, if you end up selling your company to somebody who is like not on the same page as you. 
And uh, so, you know, I, that's something that was very uh, obvious in the, in the PayPal acquisition of iSettle, I think, that the, those factors were very high on the agenda uh, throughout the discussion. So, those were some things uh, that I picked up uh, about funding uh, throughout the way. I uh, wanted to... Uh, some other things to think about. When you build your business, when you start out, think big from day one. And what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, if you set up uh, data tracking, for example, think about you know, I'm not just going to manage my three transactions here in Excel sheet, you know. What kind of uh, things will I want to track when we are a million users instead of three? Um, how can I build my tech so it's scalable, so uh, it's not going to uh, require a complete uh, refactoring in just a couple of years? How will I be able to scale it into more countries? Uh, how will I be able to scale my organization? So think really big from day one. Uh, the other thing is don't be afraid to ask for help. My, my personal view is that it's a strength to, to ask for help and not a weakness. There are so many people out there that have done, you know, have a lot of experience and, and, and done some mistakes and, and bumps in the road. So, you know, take advantage of that and learn from others. And build your network. I just mentioned LinkedIn. I don't know about you guys, but I find that LinkedIn is really, really connecting people today. And uh, there are so many people that reach out to me, uh, complete strangers, and say, you know, hey, you know, I like what you've done. You've done so much. Can I just pick your brain? And uh, I can give an example. I actually recently ended up investing uh, in a, a female-founded uh, business uh, startup. And uh, she contacted me for the first time on LinkedIn. I never met her before. We hooked up. We started to talk. And, and so it can really, you know, lead to great things. Um, a winning culture. What kind of company culture do you want? And uh, I always talk about the second bullet. Uh, don't become a bottleneck at the same time. Because as a founder or owner, it's so easy that completely unintentionally you become a bottleneck for the business because everybody wants to come to you for advice, to hear your decisions, your input, your views on everything. And uh, over time, uh, you know, it's easy when you're three or five or even 10 people. Uh, but when you're 50 or 100 or 200 people, you don't want the business to be uh, the pace of the business or the success of the business to be only resting with you. You know, you hired a lot of uh, people with great innovative uh, abilities and, and great minds. And so I always say, try to eliminate yourself and, and create a culture where people uh, dare to make a move, dare to make decisions and dare to challenge you actually. Uh, because I think that way you can really scale your business and it's all about the culture. So, I guess I'm coming to the end of my spiel here. I hope there is something in here that um, you can take advantage of. And so, uh, think about dilution <laughs> hurts, uh, you know, uh, match making is everything. Think really hard and long about that. You're in it for the long run with these people who want to invest in you, want you to succeed. But we all know, right, it, there are a lot of things that has to match, not just the, the size of the ticket. Um, and um, yeah, it's a ride. It's a lot of adrenaline. Uh, it's a lot of stress. Uh, it's not much sleep. Uh, but it's fun, and uh, I hope you guys will be successful in building your business and funding your business and uh, reaching your goals and your ambitions. Thank you for listening.